Okay, so uh, hi everybody. Um, so this is the start of a three uh, three lectures that I'll be giving. Um, title of my lectures lecture series is classifying homogeneous geometric structures. Okay, so um, so let's just dive right in. Okay, so remember that the title of our Greek project is Scream. Okay, so what does this uh, stand for? It's symmetry, curvature reduction, and equivalence methods. Okay, so what's the um, focus of my lecture series, it will focus on cartel geometric approaches to classifying locally homogeneous uh, geometric structures with more of an emphasis on so-called parabolic geometries in low dimensions. Okay, so I didn't want to um, uh, assume any background on cartel geometry. So, so this first lecture is gonna be largely motivational, um, but just uh, to give you uh, an outline of what I plan on covering today. So I'll start off with examples of homogeneous geometric structures. And then basically building up to uh, some, some motivation for the notion of a no normalized Cartan geometry. Just as a small disclaimer, however, um, there is, there's a general method called Cartan's equivalence method. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of this. Okay, so uh, this, uh, I wanna be able to start the emphasis this is really in the later lectures will be on this Cartan reduction, a uh, curvature reduction uh, material. And so I wanna be able to take the Cartan geometry as the input. Okay, so um, the Cartan equivalence method is in general a way of, of arriving at a Cartan geometry. And there's a lot of um, work that was done in the, particularly in the 20th century, but continuing on till today um, of, uh, yeah, the technical aspects about how do you, how do you get to a Cartan geometry? Okay, but um, but I, I, I wanna be able to use this uh, point of view to classifying geometric structures. Okay, so, but I'll give some references for uh, the Cartan equivalence method, uh, generalizations, or maybe somebody in, in our group could give a, uh, some more lectures on that uh, later on. Um, I also wanna introduce a, uh, an important ingredient in this story, it's called Tanaka prolongation and explain its relevance. Okay, so let me start out with examples of homogeneous geometric structures. Okay, so these are some examples of structures that we're gonna uh, talk about. So Ramanian structures, um, so these are Ramanian metrics. Uh, conformal structures, these are equivalence classes. Oh, you can see the here. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, uh, conformal structures. So, so metrics up to scale uh, by a positive function. Okay, equivalence classes of those metrics. Uh, distributions, so here's, an, here's a famous example. So um, on a five manifold, consider a distribution of rank two. So that means in the tangent space um, at each point, okay, which is five dimensional, I'm gonna specify a two dimensional subspace. Okay, but it's gonna have a certain growth and we'll get to the details of what this is, but um, yeah, growth two, three, five. Um, Aside from distributions, you can also talk about, uh, for example, the geometry of second order ODEs. So this is, uh, we'll see, it's encoded by a three manifold with a rank two distribution that um, under brackets, it fills up the entire tangent space. But on that distribution, you have extra structure. So namely you have a splitting into two line fields, E and V. Okay, what are the corresponding symmetry conditions? For metrics, it's of course well known, um, namely the, you're looking for uh, killing vector fields. And so these are vector fields that lead differentiate G to zero. For conformal structures, uh, here the right-hand side, you're allowed to rescale uh, the metric, okay, by some function. And then the, uh, for distributions and uh, second order ODs, the conditions are natural here as well. You wanna pre preserve the structure. Okay, so we preserve D to stay in D, we preserve, these line fields to respectively stay in each of them. The symmetries um, um, form a Lie algebra, okay, of vector fields. And so, so there are some natural questions that you, uh, you can ask for a given structure. What's the maximum of this dimension of um, Lie algebra of symmetries, okay? And we'll assume that, that the dimension of M is fixed here, but you, you can vary the, uh, say, among all metrics on this manifold of fixed dimension, what's the maximum um, isometry dimension or killing vector dimension? What's the next possible realizable symmetry dimension, this so-called sub-maximal symmetry dimension? And how can one classify locally homogeneous structures? 
uh, the emphasis in, in my entire lecture series will be on local geometry here. So, I mean, we want to be able to encode, um, well, we'll see that we can encode all these data on Lie algebras, okay? Um, so the, what's the condition that we want to impose? For any P uh, on your manifold M, you can look at the evaluation map from symmetries to the tangent space at that point. And we want this to be surjective, okay? For all P and M or for all P in, in some neighborhood, okay? We're interested in local geometry. And so when you're in this setting, uh, we'll encode data on the, uh, the pair of Lie algebras, F and F0. So F0 being the isotropy subalgebra at a chosen point. So this is the subalgebra of symmetries that vanish at the chosen point. Okay, so let's go through some of these examples in a little, um, in some detail. But um, yeah, just to so introduce uh, some of these, especially, um, yeah, second order ODEs and two, three, five. So for Romanian geometry, right, as I mentioned, uh, symmetries are killing vector fields. These satisfy this uh, Lie preservation condition of the metric. If you were to write this uh, PDE out explicitly, right, you write out G as, uh, as in, in, say, a coordinate basis. Um, and so this, is, this becomes a linear PDE for the vector field X, okay, so given right here. The symmetry dimension is, is well known to be um, ma majorized by n plus one choose two, where n is the dimension of M, and it's sharp on the so-called constant curvature spaces. So Rn, um, the, uh, the symmetries there are, well, rotations, reflections, translations, that forms the, uh, the Euclidean group. But at a chosen origin, you have the orthogonal transformations that preserve that point. And so you can represent Rn as a quotient, G mod um, H, say. Okay, and similarly for Sn, the sphere or hyperbolic space, you have um, analogous groups, um, uh, you could, you could represent them as a, as a quotient of Lie groups, okay? So the, the dimension of these top groups are all n plus one choose two. And you can go further and, and start asking, okay, what are the next possible symmetry dimensions? And um, so here, here, M, these are the maximums. And what are the next possible symmetry dimensions? They're tabulated here. And so this, uh, this was studied in, in, in several works uh, dating back a long time. Um, we'll go through a, a short argument about where this gap comes from. So why locally you cannot realize two, okay, later on in the talk. Let's move on to second order ODEs. In the previous, in the previous example, you were talking about Riemannian metrics, right? No, no. Riemannian metrics, yeah. Except for four. Yeah, there might be some exceptions in four, but uh, let's just stick with Riemannian for now. Okay, what about second order ODEs? How do you view this as a geometric structure? Okay, so second order ODEs, uh, you used to think about it just as an equation here, but I wanna consider the geometry associated with such equations. So I have to specify a class of transformations um, with which to see two equations, are they equivalent via this class of transformations? Again, we're considering local transformations here. These are, so the, the, the declared class is the so-called point transformations. Okay, so these are diffeomorphisms in the xy variables, but of course I wanna induce their action, the action of this transformation on the higher derivatives. Okay, so um, we wanna prolong this transformation to xy, y prime space, xy, y prime, y double prime space, and then view this basically as a submanifold. And can you move this submanifold to another submanifold uh, with this class of transformations? Um, so this is done by a so-called so prolongation procedure. Um, roughly speaking, what, what are you doing here to get these formulas? You consider a, a curve, say y as a function of x, you apply a, the point transformation, and then you get a new curve in, so y, y tilde as a function of x tilde, and then you can see how to do the derivatives uh, in the original setting map to the derivatives in the uh, new setting. Okay, and you get these formulas basically by the chain rule. What are symmetries? They are vector fields on the original space x, y, whose prolongation, okay, induced action up to this um, higher space of derivatives, x, y, p, q space, uh, that are tangent to this uh, submanifold. Q is equal to f of x, y, p. 
Okay, so some examples. So the maximum for this class is eight. And uh, example, as you would expect, is just the simplest possible equation, y double prime is equal to zero. But then there's a, a, a large gap. And uh, then the submaximal symmetry dimension is three. Here's one example, but there's several more. Um, what's interesting here is that this uh, trivial equation, y double prime is equal to zero, what is the symmetry algebra? It turns out it's a very nice Lie algebra. It's a semi-simple Lie algebra, SL3. Um, I'll come back to that shortly, but uh, this gap was studied uh, a long time ago. And so S is equal to three is due to Tress um, from all the way back in 1896. But let's think about this uh, more geometrically here. Okay, so let's, let's picture this space XYPQ space. It's locally Euclidean space, but it's equipped with additional, we wanna equip it with additional structure. Okay, so I wanna put this, um, this uh, sub bundle of one forms on it. And uh, I wanna consider this differential equation as a submanifold here. So what I could do is I could take this, um, this sub bundle of, of one forms and then pull it back to this submanifold. Okay, so Q B gets replaced by F. And so we're instead of a, a four manifold, now we're on a three dimensional submanifold. Okay, with this, um, these, uh, this rank two uh, sub bundle of uh, one forms. And then if I take the annihilator of that, then I can equ equivalently encode it as a line field. Okay, so this is looking like a total derivative, except this, uh, of course, this coefficient in front of this partial P is replaced by this function F. Okay, we're constrained. So we get a line field, a canonical line field. But with respect to prolonged point transformations, there's actually another line field, partial P, that's also distinguished. Um, so this basically arises because, right, this is the class of transformations that we're considering. If you prolong it up to XYP space, well, these, um, these transformations on XY stay the same. Uh, P tilde becomes a function of XY and P. What we have is a projectable transformation over the original space XY. Okay, so therefore the vertical, okay, the fibers of that um, are given by this partial P line field. Okay, so that's distinguished. So what I can do is I can encode this geometrically as the following. Let M be XYP space, three-dimensional space, with a so-called contact distribution. Notice that when you add E and V together, okay, so this, um, this is actually the same independent of the choice of, of F here, okay? You get exactly this space over here. It's a rank two distribution. And we wanna encode extra structure and that ex the extra structure is precisely this pair of line fields. Um, I know that when you take uh, the brackets of sections of this distribution with itself, all possible brackets, then you actually fill up the entire tangent bundle. And just, uh, just a word about notation here, when I write D bracket D, um, it, it actually, so the definition here is, is not just all brackets, but I wanna include D itself. Okay, so strictly speaking, this derived distribution, you might wanna write, some people write it as D plus D bracket D. Okay, but just for shorthand, I'm just gonna write it like this. Okay, so, um, so conversely, if you start out with uh, this data, a three manifold with a contact distribution with a splitting, turns out you could always introduce uh, coordinates rectifying one of these uh, line fields, so say V to this form and, um, and an E into this form for some function F of three variables. Okay, so, so second order ODs are completely encoded by this, uh, this setup over here. Okay, so I mentioned SL3 before um, that it comes up with y double prime is equal to zero, and that might be surprising for you if you haven't seen it for if you've seen this for the first time. What does that have to do? What does SL3 have to do with second order ODs? Here's a clue. Okay, so I want to consider a subalgebra F0 inside this F consisting of upper triangular matrices. Okay, remember uh, SL3 is trace free three by three matrices. Okay, so this is a uh, five dimensional subalgebra. And if you look at the quotient, so when I, when I quotient F by F0, then what I'm left with is this stuff strictly below the diagonal. 
But um, this quotient admits an F0 invariant filtration. Okay? There's an induced action by the adjoint representation of this F0 on this space. And uh, this subspace is F0 invariant. Actually, it even splits into two pieces, each of which is F0 invariant. Okay, so those are two distinguished um, lines under F0. Okay, so on this, uh, on this um, space here, which is basically modeling the tangent space at the identity to uh, quotient, to a homogeneous space F over F0, um, I'm getting this F0 invariant data, and that's going to induce um, some, some F invariant data on the corresponding homogeneous space. Okay. So from, from this, uh, from things at an algebraic level, we're getting invariant data on the, on the manifold. Okay. So this is, uh, this is one example. Let's move to two, three, five distributions. So here we're going to consider a five manifold with a rank two distribution with the following growth for its so-called weak derived flag. So here I'm taking D, uh, D bracket with itself. And then I'm going to bracket this uh, first derived with the original distribution itself. Okay. Um, so this generates the weak derived flag. Uh, there's something else called the strong derived flag where you, you would take um, whatever is at this level to get the next level, you just take the bracket of this with itself. So that's not what we're considering here. We're bracketing this with the original distribution. This is the weak derived flag. It has growth two, three, five. And it turns out that this has a normal form, okay, or quasi normal form uh, called the Monge form, uh, corresponding to a certain underdetermined ODE. Okay, so what does this mean? More precisely, in XYPQZ space, I want to define this um, bunch of one forms, a rank three subbundle of one forms. Okay, so these are looking like, um, like standard contact forms here. But here, uh, instead of Z prime, you replace that by F. Okay, equivalently, I could encode this by its annihilator. So that's the span of these vector fields given right here, where F is a function of five variables. I'm going to want to in impose a genericity condition on F, namely that the der double derivative does not vanish anywhere. So it turns out, given any 2, 3, 5, you could always introduce local coordinates such that your distribution looks like this, okay, with this genericity assumption. And again, what are some standard examples? Um, so the, uh, the maximum, it turns out, for such structures is uh, 14 for the symmetry algebra. And then here's a famous example called the Hilbert Cartan equation. Z prime is equal to Y double prime squared, or in, in this language here, it's Q squared. But then there's, again, a, a gap, a drop, and the next possible symmetry dimension is seven. And here's an example. Okay, there's, there's again, more than one example. Um, there's a family, a one parameter family of examples. Okay, but this Hilbert Cartan equation What's interesting here is this 14, this, um, this 14 dimensional uh, Lie algebra is a simple Lie algebra called, um, called G2. Okay, so the seven, um, this was studied in a famous paper of Cartan's in, uh, in 1910. Uh, he established this submaximal symmetry dimension. Again, what does uh, G2 have to do with two, three, five? Here, I, I can represent G2 in terms of its root diagram, and we'll come back to this uh, several times uh, throughout the course of the, uh, the, the series. Um, so here's the root diagram. Uh, on the ver at the very center, we have a thick dot, and that represents two dimensions, the so-called Cartan subalgebra of G2. All, all these other dots are worth one dimension in, in G2. What I've represented in red is a certain subalgebra, so-called parabolic subalgebra, okay, which is nine-dimensional. Um, if I quotient by all the red stuff, I get the black stuff over here, and that's representing the tangent space at the identity to a homogeneous space. And again, you can ask, how does uh, this F0 or P part act on G mod P? Sorry, or, sorry uh, I guess I was using F mod F0. And there's an F0 invariant fil filtration. So here's, uh, here it's two dimensional. Then you, uh, if under bracketing there, you produce a three dimensional subspace. And then under bracketing again, 
you get to the entire tangent space. Okay, so uh, so there's a rank two distribution um, sitting on a certain homogeneous space that's uh, that's G two invariant. Uh, two three fives are two three five geometry is is a very interesting geometry because it comes up in in uh, nice kinematical um, applications here. So here's a very very nice example, so-called rolling distributions, and uh, we'll see what do they have to do with G two. Consider a two sphere rolling on another without twisting or slipping. So the configuration space here is five dimensional. Why? Because if you have two two spheres, um, what do I need to describe any any possible configuration? I need one point on one sphere, and then I need to describe how the other sphere the second sphere is rotated relative to the first. Okay, so picking a point on the first two sphere, uh, that's an S2's worth, uh, whereas the rotation on the second sphere, that's uh, valued in SO3, the rotation group in three dimensions. Two plus three is five. Okay, but in this configuration space, okay, I have um, the tangent space or tangent bundle, um, which describes all possible velocities. But here I want to impose the no twisting or slipping condition. Okay, so no twisting uh, tells me it cuts down the possible space of velocities by one dimension in each tangent space. No slipping cuts things down a further two. So what I'm going to get to is a rank two distribution of allowable directions. Let's think of the ratio of the radii. Okay, and uh, just flipping them if, if, if necessary, we could consider. Uh, this ratio of radii to be at least one. Uh, if you do the calculations, then if rho is not equal to one, it turns out we get two, three, five geometry. If rho is equal to one, you get a Frobenius distribution. But then you can ask, what's the symmetry algebra of this rank two distribution that you get, this so-called rolling distribution? So the um, it's obvious from the from the, the setup here. I mean, you have two two spheres. You have a rotation. You have the rotation rotation group acting on each. So you have at least SO3, SO3 symmetry always. But it turns out that if rho is not equal to three, well, that's exactly, you get exactly SO3, SO3 symmetry. But if rho is equal to three, then you get something very, very interesting. The symmetry jumps up to G2. Okay, so this was first observed by Bryant, um, proved by Igor, um, and looked at in, in a few other papers uh, Bohr Montgomery by Esquerta most recently. Okay, so so two three fives, uh, very interesting geometry coming up in kinema kinematical uh, applications here. Okay, so let's uh, go into some detail about Riemannian metrics on surfaces, and just to start moving towards uh, Cartan geometry here. Okay, so let's look at the local equivalence of Riemannian metrics. So first, ask a question. So does there exist a, uh, a map from a smooth map, say from, from a Ramani manifold to another Ramani manifold that pulls um, one metric back to the other? Okay, so how can you approach this problem? So first we could locally diagonalize each of them. Okay, so say write out G in terms of an orthonormal coframe, and then similarly for G tilde. Okay, so we get orthonormal coframes on each. And then we can reformulate this question as a so-called Cartan equivalence problem. So here, um, you could ask the question, you could reformulate it as, does there exist such a map that uh, pulls back one coframe to the other, but within this ambiguity of ON? Okay, so these coefficients G are functions on the manifold with values in ON. Okay, so the key idea here is to build a bundle that incorporates this, uh, this, this structure group, this ON ambiguity. Okay, so for metrics, moving up to the orthonormal frame bundle, that's gonna be sufficient. And then um, try to find a canonical co-framing there. Other names for canonical co-framings, uh, connection, absolute parallelism. But if you're able to do this uh, in general, so this is the so-called solution in the sense of Elie Carton to the Carton equivalence problem. Okay, so let's uh, look at this in some detail for, for metrics, but I just a bit of background, I guess, uh, yeah, bit of geometry in the orthonormal frame bundle before I get into details uh, for n is equal to two case. 
OK, so uh, what do I mean by frame? So a frame at x is a linear isomorphism from Rn to the tangent space at x. Uh, corresponding coframe is the inverse. Frame bundle is a collection of all frames. So the fiber above a given point in M is all frames at X. This is a principal GLN bundle uh, with right action. Namely, I could take one of these frames and then uh, um, pre-compose on the right. Okay, so this is a general frame bundle, but given a metric, so you have this extra data of the metric, you could uh, take a fixed standard metric on Rn and then restrict these frames to those that are isometric, so preserve this metric. And so instead of having a GLN bundle, you have an, a principal ON bundle. If you have an orthonormal co-framing, okay, so you write this uh, G out in terms of that orthonormal co-framing. Equivalently, you can phrase it in terms of a, a framing. Okay, equivalently, it's a section of this orthonormal frame bundle. There's a canonical form on the frame bundle that I should have written it, so it also pulls back to um, the orthonormal frame bundle. And so what is this? It's a form that takes as input a vector field upstairs on the frame bundle or orthonormal frame bundle. And its value at the frame is, you do the following, you push, for, you push this vector field uh, forward, and then you apply the, uh, the corresponding co-frame element. Okay, so this lands you in Rn. Other things you could look for on orthonormal frame bundle, principal connections. Okay, so these are one forms on uh, this space with values in um, the structure algebra, so the Lie algebra of o ON. So it satisfies a nice uh, behavior equivariancy with respect to the fiber group. And it, re it, it reproduces the fundamental uh, vertical vector fields. So, so what are these guys? They are the infinitesimal generators of the right action on that bundle. Note that for principal connections, um, so the rank of the kernel here of a principal connection is n. Okay, so in, in general, so, so, um, so these principal connections, they're not co-framings. Okay? That's gonna be contrasted with Carton connections, which are co-framings later on. Okay, so let's specialize to n is equal to two and say what we can in this setting. So, Let's, uh, let's write this G in terms of an orthonormal coframe. Uh, if you have another orthonormal coframe, it differs by this one by an O2 action. Let me cheat a little bit and just uh, stick with SO2 for the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna define uh, theta one and theta two as taking the original coframe and then applying one of these group elements to it. Okay, so I want to view this um, not for fixed values of t, but for arbitrary values of t. So, so really, I'm, I'm viewing these as living upstairs okay, on, on the orthonormal frame bundle. Okay, so a little exercise. Let's start computing uh, their d's, their exterior derivatives. A little exercise. You could show that d theta 1, it has this expression right here. d theta 2 has this expression right here. But then you could try to simplify. We want to try to get to a canonical co-framing, okay? And part of getting to there is to try to simplify these structure equations as much as possible, and then see how much uh, the co-frame is fixed by the form of these structure equations. So if you stare at this, um, you'll you realize that you could actually simplify. You could absorb some of these uh, these terms through a judicious choice. Okay, so namely, if you take gamma defined like this, then you could write this d theta one as this expression right here, d theta two looking like that. Um, but I want to get co-frame, and remember, uh, so upstairs, uh, so when you're, so when I'm on a two manifold downstairs, the orthonormal frame bundle is three dimensional, so I need uh, one extra form. That's going to be this gamma. What are the what's the corresponding structure equation? So d of gamma you could obtain it through, um, through looking at d squared. So take these structure equations for theta one and theta two, apply another d to it. d squared is equal to zero, integrability condition. And then you get some conditions on d gamma. Okay, so this expression is equal to zero, this expression is equal to zero. So d gamma has to be um, of this form right here, right? It's a two form. Okay, so it has to be a multiple of theta one and theta two. So these are our structure equations. 
Okay, so those are those are very very important. Okay, these structure equations. It turns out uniquely determine this coframe. Okay, if you try to find another one, you won't be able to. It's it's unique. It's a canonical coframe. Meaning that these that these functions a and b are totally determined, right? Uh, a and B, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, in this case, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, okay, so corresponding to omega, you have the corresponding dual basis, uh, written in this, well, when I first saw it, it's kind of funny notation, but, um, this partial gamma is basically generating the, um, the vertical action, okay, by these, um, these rotations, right? Um, so that's the infinitesimal generator. So now you could start uh, asking, okay, how do these uh, how do these coframes coframe elements how do they behave with respect to this vertical action? So a little exercise with these structure equations, um, figure out these these relations right here. In particular, C does not change under this vertical action. C, of course, is is something very familiar. Um, it's it's just uh, the Gaussian curvature, but reinterpreted upstairs. But because uh, it's on this orthonormal frame bundle, okay. But because it's it's invariant under uh, under the action of the uh, these rotations, it descends to some function downstairs. Okay. So, but the, let's just sum up here. I mean, we we start out with a metric, and what we got to is uh, a unique co-framing upstairs on this orthonormal frame bundle. Um, this being a canonical object associated to G, uh, symmetries of G will induce symmetries of the co-framing. And because of uh, commutativity of uh, pullbacks with D, then uh, any uh, symmetry upstairs will preserve corresponding structure functions. What do I mean by structure functions? If I have a co-framing omega, okay, and the components are omega K, I take their Ds. I can write that in terms of the co-framing itself. And these coefficients are structure functions. Okay, so for us, I mean, we only had one non-constant, potentially non-constant structure function, namely the C coming up, but this is how it would work in general. Um, so for metrics, we get uh, that uh, the C is, is an invariant under this lifted symmetry. Uh, Dennis, may I ask something here? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, so from these structure equations, is it immediate uh, that if C is zero function in higher dimension matrix, uh, then uh, we have I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, then we have flat matrix. Is it immediate? I didn't quite, is it immediate what? Uh, to show that if C is uh, zero, then we have flat case, flat matrix. Yes, yes, I mean, you will, you will get, uh, so if C is equal, if, if it's constant, then this will correspond to the different constant curvature spaces, right? I mean, basically, you're you're on a Lie group. No, uh, it is a it is a well known fact, but is the proof immediate? No, uh, 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 Misha, it is simply like that. That if C is constant, the the the, the structure equations that you have are equations right. with constant coefficients. So these Maurer Cartan forms on some group. This group is three dimensional. So yep. the symmetry of these things with C equal constant is equal to three and this maximal symmetry for two dimensional metrics. So it must be flat or this other two. Okay, but if C is zero, it is immediate that is, the metric is flat. Yes, because symmetry is just yeah. a group of motions in dimension two times R. Okay. We see it from structure equations immediately. Yeah? Uh, well, okay, so uh, let me just. No, I'm asking not about the fact. I know the fact. I am asking uh, is from these equations. Uh, if, 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 so, so, if C is equal to zero, it follows immediately, right? That, yes, uh, even if Pavel said. This is what Pavel said. Absolutely. Yep. You okay. have the Maurer Cartan equation, so you have the structure of the group, so you know the, yep. you know the geometry, you know G mod H, and that's all, I think. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, but in general, okay, so if C is non-constant, what can you do? You can start looking at its, its D, okay? Take its exterior derivative. Again, write it in terms of the, uh, the co-framing itself. You get some potentially new functions, C1, C2, C3. Um, again, because of commutativity of uh, pullbacks with D, 
phi will preserve these new structure functions, C1, C2, C3. And you keep going. Okay, so definition, the rank R of a coframe is the number of uh, functionally independent functions that you obtain via this process. And there's a theorem that says, okay, if I have a coframe of rank R on an M manifold, then the dimension of the symmetry algebra here of the coframe is simply M minus R. Okay, so if, if, if you just have C being equal to a constant, whether it be zero or non-zero, right? Uh, but if it's constant, then the rank is just, R, so R is just zero and the dimension of the symmetry algebra uh, is M. Okay, so the dimension of the manifold on which it's supported. Um, yeah, in this case that R is equal to zero. So um, you get the structure equations for a Lie uh, algebra, a Lie group uh, as, as Pablo mentioned. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so that's the setup here. So let me uh, mention this, uh, this, um, this how do you prove this uh, gap for symmetry gap for surface metrics? So any uh, Ramanian surface okay, cannot have precisely two killing vectors. Okay, so this is a, a local proof, okay? So um, yeah, so uh, in particular, I don't wanna be in the situation of, of thinking about a cylinder, right? Because a cylinder uh, is locally flat. Of course, it has, uh, it has a translation along the axis and then a, the rotation, but it's, it's locally flat. So in fact, that's three uh, uh, killing vectors. When thought locally. Okay, so on the orthonormal frame bundle, we saw that there exists a unique co-framing with the following structure equations. Okay, so I can start taking their Ds, okay? Um, you don't get anything new from, uh, from the theta one and theta two structure equations, but the, uh, for the gamma one, you get to the following. So DC has to be, well, it's a one form and it's gotta be a linear combination of theta one and theta two. Okay, so I'm gonna expand and get these. This was C, C1 and C2 in the previous notation. Okay, so uh, some new structure functions, F and G. Okay, so if you assume that the symmetry dimension is precisely two, that means by the theorem I put on the previous slide that the rank of this coframe is one. Okay, so that means in particular C is non-constant. Okay. Um, and F and G are functions of C. Okay, I, don't, I only get one functionally independent function coming out from this, uh, this process that we mentioned previously. But let's start taking exterior derivatives. Okay, again, use integrability. A little calculation here. Uh, you find the following expressions. Okay, and this should be equal to zero. But what do I have here? I have a coframe. So gamma theta one theta two are, is a coframe. So when I take their wedges all together, it's something non-zero. But this all has to be equal to zero. So that tells me that F and G are zero. Okay, but that's telling me that C is constant. Okay, so that's a contradiction. Okay, so this is the, how you prove this, uh, this, this gap for Ramanian metrics uh, on surfaces. Okay, so let me explain some ideas behind cartel geometry. Okay, before I get to the definition, just uh, there's this nice diagram of ideas at the beginning of, um, Richard Sharp's book. Um, so just to start off, I mean, there's two general, well-known generalizations of Euclidean geometry. On the one hand, you, you, you focus on the symmetries. Okay, so Euclidean group mod the orthogonal group, and then you get the so-called Klein perspective. Okay, but here, I guess I wanna talk about more than just this quotient of Lie groups G mod P. I wanna talk about the, um, I wanna focus on, on G and, and this, principal P bundle that you have over this uh, space downstairs. It's endowed with some structure, namely the Maracatan form. Okay, um, so this is homogeneous. Okay, and um, right in the, in the 19th century, this was uh, Klein's and Langer program was, was, was observing that uh, many nice geometries can be viewed in this way, uh, group theoretically. On the other hand, there's this other generalization of Euclidean geometry, which in general, not homogeneous at all. Um, it's very lumpy. Uh, so uh, at each, in each tangent space on a manifold, you endow it with the Ramanian metric, right? Ramanian geometry. There's a common generalization of these and that's, that's Cartan geometry, okay? So the, um, 
when you pass from right uh, from left to right, basically the idea is there you want to curve things up. Okay, so Cartan geometry uh, is viewed as a curved version of this homogeneous model. Passing up, th this is basically basically a reinterpretation of my downstairs structure. Okay, um, we saw the motivation coming from from frames, okay, orthonormal frame rule. Okay, but, but now you can actually use this idea and really vastly generalize it. Instead of starting with Euclidean geometry, now start off with y double prime is equal to zero. Okay, then here you get second order ODE geometry. Okay, over here, it's reinterpretation in terms of symmetries. So SL3 mod a certain parabolic subgroup. And then here would be the common generalization. Yeah, how do you view second order ODE as Cartan geometry? Okay, so. Um, let's get to the formal definition here. So let G be a Lie group, P a closed subgroup. Cartan geometry of type GP consists of a right principal bundle with a Cartan connection. Okay, what does this mean? It's a co-framing on the one hand. So it's a linear isomorphism on each tangent space. Um, the values of this one form are in the Lie algebra of the modeling group. It has some nice equivariancy properties with respect to the fiber group, okay, with respect to P, um, and it reproduces the fundamental vertical vector fields. Okay, so these are all generalizations of the so-called Marcartan form. Um, actually, I guess before I uh, state that. So um, some facts. So this Cartan connection is a co-framing. So in particular, it trivializes the tangent bundle of this, uh, this top space um, calligraphic G. Um, but then you could also show that the tangent bundle downstairs is written as an associated bundle for G. Okay, so you, this frac G mod frac P, um, if I have P invariant data on here, it nicely transfers to um, some natural data over here. So if I have a P invariant filtration, well, on this space, I'm gonna get a natural um, filtration on of my tangent bundle. What's the symmetry algebra of such a structure uh, upstairs? It's P invariant vector fields that Li differentiate my uh, Cartan connection to zero. Okay, and the so-called flat model in this setting is just G over G mod P um, with Mar Cartan form. So this is the unique left invariant form whose value at the identity is uh, at the identity element is just the identity map. Um, and this has, well, you, uh, this Marcatan form satisfies the well-known Marcatan equation. What's going to be different is for general Cartan connections, when you, is when you take this expression, it's not always going to be zero. Okay, this is the notion of curvature. So, uh, so this is a definition of curvature, just uh, uh, to be... Yeah, explicit, the, sometimes there's some confusion about this half. What does this mean? It means actually like this without any half, okay? Um, I'm inserting vector fields into each slot, but then uh, I want to do it in an anti-symmetric way and then the, the sign cancels and then that cancels with the two. Um, so this is the same thing as this. Uh, this is flat, this Cartan geometry is flat uh, if, it's z if this curvature is zero. In this case, you could prove that this is locally equivalent, always locally equivalent to this flat model. The equivariancy condition on the Cartan connection uh, induces an equivariancy condition for curvature. Okay, so this is going to be very important. Um, and then, but curvature here is horizontal, okay, unlike the Cartan connection. Okay, what does that mean? It means when I insert one of these vertical guys, uh, then you get zero. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so you you could you, little exercise uh, show show that this is true. Okay. Um, so what I've written here is just the taking that axiom two, and then just differentiating it, infinitesimalizing it. Um, so the generator generators are the right action, as I've mentioned before, these fundamental vertical vector fields. So. So Lie differentiating uh, omega by one of these fundamental vertical vector fields, um, you get minus this add A action on the Cartan connection. Um, okay, so since I have a co-framing, okay, 
then I can take my curvature and evaluate it on that co-framing. And this produces a so-called curvature function. So a priori, it's, it's a function on G valued in wedge two of G star tensor G, but then K is horizontal. So I could actually um, descend that to a function valued in this space. So this uh, curvature function is uh, equivariant. Its codomain is a P module. Um, so ideally, we're going to, I mean, the name of the game is to take this underlying structure downstairs and reinterpret it as, um, as one of these objects upstairs, Carton connections upstairs. Um, but if you want to get some sort of equivalence of categories, a one-to-one -one correspondence, Right? In general, you're gonna to have to put some extra conditions on omega to, to determine it uniquely. These are so-called normalization conditions. And ideally they're well-behaved with respect to this fiber group P. Okay, so for example, um, in the Ramanian setting, uh, well, okay, so in general here, before specializing to Ramanian, uh, there's a notion of torsion freeness. Okay, so instead of being valued in this space, you could constrain uh, the output of these uh, over here to just lying in P. Okay, that's certainly a P invariant condition. Okay, and, and that's precisely the condition that, that is needed in the Romanian setting. So the fundamental theorem of Romanian geometry can be restated as, as follows. Let's um, fix groups G and P, Euclidean group, uh, orthogonal group with Lie algebras like this. Um, you could write this in terms of a matrix model as, as follows. Okay. And the fundamental theorem is that there is an equivalence of categories between Romanian metrics and torsion free Cartan geometries of type Euclidean group, uh, orthogonal group. Okay. Um, how do you uh, produce this in general? Well, we've seen these objects earlier. So um, you have the soldering form, which is canonical, that's, that's always there. But then there's this uh, principal connection part that you have in general some choice for. But um, if you impose this torsion freeness condition, that pins down this principal connection part uniquely. That's the so-called levy chivita connection. Okay, but this is this is now a full co-framing and it satisfies the, the properties of a Cartan connection. So those structure, those important structure equations that were produced earlier, how do you get this um, uh, alternatively? You could uh, write down the Cartan connection in this form, okay, with components looking like this. You take its curvature, looks like this. Okay, but uh, if you want it to be torsion free, that means it's going to take values in the SON part. It's not going to have any values in the RN part. Okay, so torsion freeness, that's responsible for this equality right here. The fact that uh, these components are not involving gamma, that's because of horizontality of the curvature. Okay, so it has to look like this. And, um, and then you, this, you, you get precisely those structural equations that we had before. Okay. Of course, this, this, this generalizes to uh, yeah, arbitrary dimensions, but this is, you know, just wanna focus on the simplest case here. Okay, so Cartan's uh, equivalence method uh, and refinements. I mean, beyond metrics, so, so these are so-called ON structures, one can consider other G0 structures. So where G0 is a closed subgroup of GLN, okay? And here this calligraphic G0 is um, some, some reduction of the frame bundle, okay? So where this is now a principal G0 bundle. But in general, there does not exist a distinguished co-framing on G0. Um, maybe for some G0s it's true, but for, for others, it might not be true. In particular for um, conformal structures, if you consider CON being your structure group, then working on the conformal frame bundle is, is not sufficient. There's still some ambiguity in your structure. Okay, so what's the natural thing to do? You build a new bundle, okay? In general, you keep going. If there's, if there's ambiguity uh, with trying to find a canonical co-framing on that new space, you build a new bundle. Okay, in general, you get a tower of bundles. So this process is known as Cartan's equivalence method. And um, uh, for 235, there, this famous uh, paper of Cartan's in 1910, the so-called five variables paper, was really a tour de force uh, application of this Cartan's equivalence method. 
this was uh, uh, the inspiration and for, for further refinements beginning around the late 1960s, uh, particularly in the Japanese school, due to Tanaka, Morimoto, uh, Yamaguchi. Um, so here um, they studied uh, filtered manifolds and filtered G0 structures. I'll get to what, what that means uh, shortly. Um, they used an important algebraic tool called Tanaka prolongation, which gives you an upper bound on the symmetry dimension. And it introduced powerful um, algebraic tools coming from harmonic theory and introducing a, a notion called fundamental or harmonic curvature. Okay, so, so we'll say more about that later. But as I mentioned, uh, this was not meant to be a tutorial about uh, Cartan equivalence method. Uh, so some suggested re reading on Cartan equivalence method. Um, I guess I first learned one of the first uh, books I looked at was was Alvar's book on equivalence invariance symmetry. Um, uh, Igor looked at it in the filtered setting and, and phrased things nicely, analogous to um, well, very much in the spirit of Singer Sternberg prolongation. So that, there's a nice paper uh, that he wrote in 2009. Uh, the most recent accounts, um, yeah, whereas these first two papers, they don't, uh, they don't really discuss uh, Cartan geometry. So uh, Andreas Chap's paper, uh, fairly recently, 2017, focuses on the existence and constructing uh, canonical connect Cartan connections in this filtered uh, G structure setting. Okay. So uh, those are some recommended re references. Okay, so I just wanted to give you uh, so a short little introduction to Tanaka theory. I mean, we have some motivation already. I mean, uh, we've looked at Romani metrics only, but we had uh, second order ODs, uh, two, three, five. There you have filtrations coming out. So what do we do in that setting uh, in an analogous spirit to some of the ideas that I've introduced uh, so far? Okay, so, uh, so this will lay some the groundwork for, uh, for where I wanna start with next time. Okay, so let's take a distribution. For, form the corresponding weak derived flag, seen the idea before. Uh, we're going to assume that each of these bundles that are constructed uh, in this weak derived flag, they're constant rank. Okay. Um, suppose, moreover, that it's bracket generating. So eventually you fill up the entire tangent bundle. So we're going to get a filtration. Once you have a filtration, the natural thing to do is uh, one natural thing to do is to take its associated graded. So we do this point by point. So namely uh, define GI as a quotient of DI plus uh, mod DI plus one. Um, so the, the guy previous to it. And then we're gonna form this direct sum of all these associated graded pieces. Okay, so this is the so-called symbol algebra. Oop, jumped ahead. But um, the nice thing about this symbol algebra, okay, so first of all, why is it an algebra? So the Lie bracket of vector fields induces a, a tensorial bracket on each um, m of x, okay? Turning it into a nilpotent graded Lie algebra called a symbol algebra. And we're gonna assume um, uh, a nice regularity condition, okay? So bracket jittering and, and, and this condition sometimes go by uh, strong regularity. Um, so all of these symbol algebras at each point should be isomorphic to some fixed model uh, nilpotent graded Lie algebra. Okay. Um, why do we get a tensorial op operation? Well, here just an example. Let's take x and y being two sections. So I'm not, I don't. Some people put uh, symbol gamma here. I'll, I'll be loose here. So here I mean sections of d minus one. Okay. Two vector fields in there. If I multiply them by functions, okay, we get the usual formula looking like this. Okay. But then if we mod out by, um, if we take the brackets and we mod out by the previous uh, distribution, right? This is actually valued in D minus two. If we mod out by the previous uh, distribution, it kills this term and it kills this term, okay? So this operation naturally becomes uh, bilinear over functions, okay? So this is a tensorial operation, okay? So this is called the Levy bracket. Okay, so, so what do we do uh, given this setup? Um, what's the bundle that you build? So given M and D as before, one has a natural graded frame bundle. So here you take the so-called graded frames. So what is a graded frame? It's a linear, uh, it's, a, it's an isomorphism from your fixed uh, model 
nilpotent graded Lie algebra to the one at the given point. Okay, so this is isomorphism as nilpotent graded Lie algebra. Okay, so if you um, if you don't have a filtration, right, then you just stop at minus one level. Um, so so m and m of x would just be abelian Lie algebras at each point. What's the corresponding structure group? Previously, uh, in the G-structure case, we had GLNR. Okay, here, it's naturally auto graded automorphisms of this nilpotent graded Lie algebra. Um, the corresponding structure algebra, namely the Lie algebra of this automorphism, graded automorphism group, are the graded derivations of M. Now, since we assume this bracket generating condition, so G minus one generates the entire negative part, then any derivation, graded derivation, is, um, is induced by some value uh, of how it acts on the minus one level. So actually, there's an injection from graded derivations into GL G minus one. You can specify reductions now. Okay, so if you want to put extra structure on the distribution, okay, so this is some closed subgroup of graded automorphisms. And so you get this uh, subalgebra of graded derivations. Okay, so analogous to ON structures, metrics being an ON reduction of the frame bundle, the filtered G0 structure is a G0 reduction of these, this graded frame bundle. Okay, so, so given such a reduction, I mean, you, you of course have the fibers down to M and the tangent uh, bundle there. So you get the vertical distribution. And analogous to before, you can try, try to choose uh, a horizontal complement canonically. Okay, that's basically what we're doing, but just we phrased it in a dual language earlier. Um, so try to find this horizontal complement. Uh, if you can't find it canonically, if there's some ambiguity, you build a new bundle. Okay, so you get this geometric prolongation producing G1, then G2 if necessary, you get this tower of bundles analogous to before. Examples of symbol algebras. Okay, so in the Ronian setting, you had M be just G minus one. There's no filtration here. This is abelian. And then G zero is O N. Here you graded automorphisms, it's just G L M. Okay. Second order ODEs. Okay, so here you're on a three dimensional space. Um, uh, here's the minus one level. You could take some abstract generators E1 and E2. Um, their bracket, the Levy bracket produces this structure relation E1, E2 is equal to E3. So what I have is the Heisenberg Lie algebra, but it comes equipped with a grading. On top of G minus one, you have a splitting into two pieces, okay, two lines. And G zero, um, so if you just consider graded derivations of this G minus one G, of this M with this, this, this structure relation, you actually get graded derivations being GL two, okay, four dimensional. But G0 is constrained because we're just interested in rescalings along those distinguished lines. Okay, so here G0 is two dimensional. What about two, three, five? Again, a little ca calculation to, uh, to find out this, uh, this structure. But what you get are these, uh, these, this symbol algebra over here. So E1 bracket E2, it generates a new direction in the G minus two level. Then you, you bracket this E3 with E1 and E2 to produce the minus three level, okay? So this is the symbol algebra, two, three, five. But okay, I have a nilpotent graded Lie algebra that's negatively graded. Um, so one natural algebraic question that you can ask is what's the, um, what's the natural extension of this as a graded Lie algebra? Okay, this is, uh, leads into the notion of Tanaka prolongation. Okay, so the setup is given a nilpotent graded Lie algebra, some reduction of graded derivations. Let this prolongation be the graded Lie algebra uh, with a non-positive part specified. Okay, so M and G zero. Uh, add the condition, what's the second axiom? If you're in the positive side, then it brackets, so, so yeah, you, you, want, a non, you want a non degeneracy condition. Okay, so um, if you're uh, on the positive side, uh, such that it brackets with everything in the minus one level to zero, then X is equal to zero. Okay, um, you wanna put this in there because you don't wanna throw in some, some, some extraneous things that, that aren't visible 
on the negative side. Why is it sufficient to just do it on minus one? Is because I'm in the I'm in the bracket generating setting, right? So if it's true there, then uh, then it's going to be true um, for all of M. Okay, so two basic axioms and then some maximality condition. Okay, so it's maximum among all GLAs satisfying the two conditions. Um, in some cases, your G0 is just uh, as big as possible, namely graded derivations. And in this case, instead of writing PRM G0, you just write PRM. Okay, so why is this important? This goes back to Tanaka. Um, this prolongation is unique up to isomorphism, first of all. And uh, geometrically, what, is, what does it do? This algebraic gadget, its uh, dimension is an upper bound for the symmetry algebra of a filtered G0 structure. Okay, um, the, this algebraic process and these levels that appear on the positive side are basically mimicking um, algebraically this, this geometric prolongation at the bundle level, or this geometric tower of bundles. I should mention that, uh, uh, so one can weaken this strong regularity condition, this, this uh, more recent count. So this is, um, this is Boris's work, um, Boris Kuglikov's work finite dimensionality in Tanaka theory from 2011. Okay, so some examples of Tanaka prolongation. So first of all, the, the, so for the, for the structures that we consider. Okay, so let me just uh, mention, so the, let me define the heights of this prolongation is the maximal integer, non-negative integer, such that this prolongation at, level, at this level, K, is non-zero. Okay, so here's a little table. For metrics, um, there is no positive part to the prolongation. It stops at this level G0. For conformal, you have just the minus one level for, for M, G0 level, and then you have one extra level um, at, uh, yeah, so positive one, and then it stops there. Second order ODEs, you go up to level two. Two, three, five, you go up to level three. And there's a, there's a certain, there's a symmetry that, that, a, that manifests itself between the negative side and the positive side. In particular, the levels that appear on the, on, on, uh, on the positive side are the same dimension as what appears in the negative. There's a certain duality that, that appears, uh, but we'll get into more details about that next time. Um, so of course there, there's, uh, there's some results to be proven here, but um, just to show you that, that this is these, these uh, prolongations are, are reasonable. Well, um, so if you look at SL3, right, it's graded, you could give it a grading that looks like this. So uh, SL3, right, it contains that original M and G0. So this, if you take this being your G0, it acts on these two lines as scalings. Okay, so, so certainly the Tanaka prolongation will, will include at least SL3, but theorem, there's, it's, it's not any more than SL3. For G2, um, you have this grading going from minus three to three, which includes the symbol algebra here. So the Tanaka prolongation will be at least as much as this, but result, it's, it's no more. Okay, okay. so these, these, um, these prolongations G and these subalgebras P are so-called examples of parabolic, uh, these P's are par parabolic subgroups of semi-simple lead groups. Um, metrics, uh, this, is, this is not an example of a parabolic geometry, okay? This is not a semi-simple algebra, but these are examples of parabolic, um, parab these are parabolic examples, okay? So that's where we're gonna be headed next time. So just to summarize my lecture, okay? So the upshot here is that Cartan geometry is a nice solution of the Cartan equivalence problem. It's a co-framing, but beyond uh, being a co-framing, Okay, which is the end goal of the Cartan equivalence method, you have extra conditions on this co-framing, namely that it reproduces the fundamental vertical vector fields and it satisfies this equivariancy condition along the fibers. Okay. But beyond this, it basically provides a nice unifying framework upstairs, despite this zoo of potentially, this, this zoo of downstairs structures. Okay. And uh, you'll see, Representation theory of the 
uh, representation theory coming up more and more. Um, at least I'll, I'll go through some of this in uh, starting next time. Okay, so what do I plan on covering next time? Um, I defined a parabolic geometry, okay, but I didn't state any normalization conditions. Okay, so that's what we want to uh, get to next. Normalization for conditions for parabolic geometries to get a categorical equivalence to underlying structures. I want to mention the, the theorem of constant and harmonic curvature, um, which is really important. Um, but I want to be able to get to this uh, Cartan reduction method for how you use all these uh, and use this framework for classifying uh, homogeneous geometric structures next time. Okay, so thanks very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, Dennis. Yes, uh, Mr. Hey. Are there some generalizations uh, of the symbol for the case that the flag of distribution, some distributions in the flag do not, do not have constant round? Is there a generalization of the symbol? No need for an approximation symbol. Uh, yes, whatever uh, it's named, for the similar. case that uh, in the flag of distribution, some of them, at least one of them, doesn't have constant round. Yeah, I think uh, probably Igor or Boris would be probably the... Um, huh? Yes, I think that uh, the, the generalization is called core algebra. I mean, it's Ignatovich. You mean, you mean what Svetlana Ignatovich? Uh... Yes, and uh, you, can, you can also do it more algebraically, right? Yeah, uh, but... Then, then instead of like, instead of uh, graded nilpotently algebra, you actually have uh, a pair of, like, you have a sub-algebra of three truncated nilpotent and then like the the model is not on the Lie algebra but on not on the Lie group but on the homogeneous space. Is it written and, somewhere or just uh, you know it's from Svetlana or it is written somewhere? Yes it it is written I actually I can send I actually have a review of, of some book even I, I have a kind of a book review I have a text when, that written by me where it is described. No, well, either if it's some readable text, I would appreciate it. Yes, it, it's even cited in, in mass in mass signet. I will send okay. you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I should mention I um uh so I, I prepared some Maple files, but uh to demonstrate in yeah, in Maple, how do you do some of these symmetry calculations and uh, how do you do Tanaka prolongation? Um, although, yeah, it might have run, run a bit long, so, uh, but I'll put these on, on the website at least. Are there um, any other questions? Do you have things in Maple how to construct Katan uh, No. <laughs> I, I have a question. Dennis. Yeah, I want to ask from you and also the experts. The others that uh, so you exactly mentioned that this Cartan geometry is a nice solution, but uh, what are some of the perhaps uh, well known some of the uh, uh, geometric structures that is prove they're proved or experts suspect that do not um, have a can, cannot you know you, you cannot associate a Cartan geometry to it. Uh, so I believe that the so. Hasn't uh, Pavel and Katya, one of their um, recent uh, works where they studied uh, marked twisted angle structures, right? It was, wasn't that one example where, Katya, did you find that there, there's no Cartan connection in this, in this case? If you are asking us, there are two experts in the same room. There is Katya and me. Katya says that there is no connection. And I said that there is. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the question is like, uh, is there any geometric structure that do not have Cartan connection? But, yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah. there, there was this lecture. There was little, this lecture of Robert Bryant here in Banach Center about these these things that didn't have Cartan connection in three dimensions. I oh. I I I listened to the lectures and then lecture and then I went home and I tried to prove that there is a Cartan. <laughs> okay. You know. And what, what's the verdict now on the on um on, on two non degenerate? Uh, yeah, so. I went there. Yeah. Carton connection uh, or not? I... Uh, are there? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. 
You mean turn on the generate CR structures? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, so um, yeah. I think that it, 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 so. it depends in which case. If you just if you just yeah. kill some invariant, there there is a Cartan connection. That, that but is. the question is, but there is no Cartan connection in general. Yes, yeah, that's the, correct. In the case of two non-degenerate CR. Yes. Yeah. I believe that in two, three, five, six case there is no Cartan connection, but I, three, it, five, it should six. be written. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. Like the next, like even if you fix a, like there are three symbols there, but even if, if you fix like the most symmetric symbol, mm -hmm. there is no Cartan connection there, but it's not. It, really. Is it precise question? Cartan connection exists or not? Uh, so it uh, yes, is an answer yes or no? It is a perfectly precise question. question. Yes, it's precise. It's totally algebraic. It's up to invariant. Invariance of normalization condition, right, under a joint action. So uh, there are cases uh, that it can be proved that Cartan convection does not exist, right? That's correct. Yes. I mean, it's, not, it's purely algebraic question. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Is it actually Igor, because in principle, like you go along the lines uh, of Tanaka constructing uh, fiber bundle, and then you know you have to do normalization. Of course, you would like to do it equivalently. But that doesn't imply that there is no other approach to get So you think it's not if and only if? I mean, I think it's if and you, I mean, you mean this invariance of normalization condition is, is not necessary condition for existence of Cartan. No, with this approach to construct a frame bundle, yes, it, it, it is necessary. But if just you look to definition of, of, of Dennis, that for Cartan geometry. So so why don't we, <clears throat> right? But I, I believe that actually, so what, what so you think that there is cart like if there exists Cartan connection, then the normalization condition in that approach must be invariant. No, I'm not sure. I think that that is true. But I, I, I think maybe I should say something that I think that the that the, 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 the uh, strengths of uh, Cartan equivalence method, and it is I think it is why it was introduced by Cartan that that it is very nice uh, tool to produce invariants and to produce homogeneous models even if there is no Cartan connection. Cartan connection is not needed. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah true. So it, it's just like if there's Cartan connection that it's very important, it's very convenient to pull down invariants from the frame bundle to the base. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, but these, these are sort of nice cases, but you don't need to have Cartan connection to find invariants, right? No, 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 that's the strength of Cartan. Right, but, but, there, but there was a kind of discussion with some relativists. Uh, so what to call Cartan invariance for metrics. And, and, and there was two different viewpoints. So one, you just do the Cartan approach and you construct bundle, and then you have the structure functions upstairs, which are invariant and you differentiate them. But you get functions upstairs there, right? But yes, the invariant will be not tensors on the base, yes. It's, not on the base, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's, it's hard, yeah. right? So and that's with, with canonical Cartan approach, right? But mm -hmm. relativists understand different story. They actually understand Cartan invariance is something that actually live downstairs, right? And if you don't have Cartan connections, that's actually difficult to, to pull them down. But you still do it through normalization. It doesn't matter if you're not. <coughs> The, pr the, the prime example of this, what I'm saying, is that Cartan didn't make Cartan connection in the, right. the force. Right. As, 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 uh, Absolutely right. right. But, but, but of course, you can still get, get uh, all, all the invariants. Yeah. You can do just different normalization, not equivalent. Yes, you can, but you, you don't need Cartan connection for this. Okay, that, but it's, it's very nice to have Cartan connection, I agree. It's very nice. Okay, are there uh, any other questions? Okay, for your talk, very nice. I have kind of very well. also a question. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Dennis. Very You're good. You're very welcome. Uh, next Thanks. talk in two weeks. Thanks. Thanks for coming, guys. Bye.